So, so welcome everybody officially to our informational meeting for Erin Turtle Pop Project 2.0. Uh, we did some brief introductions, I suppose, a few moments ago, but I'm Dave Steinberg uh, at UNH, one of the project leads. And I'm Jen Pernhage. I'm also at UNH. And um, we have a third uh, project lead, Ali Degrassi, who's at Shenandoah University, and um, she couldn't be here today. Um, but yeah, thank you again. And uh, we are recording this so that we can share it with all of the people who uh who are interested in participating in Turtle Pop and couldn't be here today, but we really appreciate those of you who are able to be here. So, um, Dave. Perfect. Oh, and please, I think one thing we wanted to say is um, we don't have, like, we don't have a script. We're not, we don't have, like, we have an agenda, obviously, right here, but please feel free to interrupt us at any point um, and ask questions along the way. And I will try to keep an eye also on the chat if you're putting questions in there so that we can address them that way. So that, Dave, I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna start off just talking really briefly about what this project is and what our goals are. Uh, and then we'll transition into what you might need to contribute in order to be a participant. And then we'll go through what it might be like to be out in the field collecting data as part of this project. And we'll give a brief introduction to some of the project materials that we have available already, and some that will be available in the coming weeks. As Jen mentioned, please, any questions that come up, any clarifications that you want, uh, just speak up or, or put a note in the chat. Uh, this can be um, more informal as long as we can answer the questions for people, that's, that's our main goal. So this project, uh, some of you may know is really uh, an extension of Erin Turtle Pop 1.0 or the original Erin Turtle Pop project, which was led by Dave Bown and a number of other folks through the Ecological Research as Education Network. And uh, Dave and, and other folks were able to leverage this network of folks who uh, a, a lot of times are more focused on instruction um, to uh, sample turtle populations across a, a pretty wide geographic range. And uh, they were mainly interested in, in trying to see what the effects of urbanization might be on turtle population structure and sex ratio. And they hypothesized that there would be uh, a negative correlation between uh, female uh, proportions, uh, proportions of females in a population and urbanization, but actually found the opposite of that, which was a bit uh, surprising. But um, this group uh, noted in their publication that there were a few limitations of the project, one of them being that there was some potential uh, spatial non-independence uh, because some of the sites were uh, were geographically clustered. And also there wasn't necessarily um, uh, as much of a trapping effort as they would ideally have preferred. And so this is where we are coming in. Uh, this project was really successful in engaging a lot of institutions, a lot of students. Um, and we were thinking, how can we revitalize this, introduce it, introduce it to a new generation of students, and also continue to answer the initial questions that were asked about the effects of urbanization on turtle population structure. So uh, in order to, to try to um, uh, overcome some of those limitations of the first turtle pop, we're going to be instituting a paired ponds design or approach where we have a rural and urban pond uh, that are in relatively close proximity to one another. And we're also going to be using, as you'll see in a moment, turtle traps that are slightly smaller 
um, but we can put more of them out per pond to increase air trapping effort. And we're going to do all of this with a network again of participants in order to try to test a few different hypotheses, um, which you can see listed up here. Mainly, we're, we're thinking that turtle populations in rural or urban areas are going to differ significantly in abundance, sex ratio, and potentially stage or um, or size structure uh, for all sorts of different potential reasons. Uh, the amount of roads going through may um, uh, bias mortality towards females. There may be environmental contaminants in urban areas versus uh, rural areas that might uh, affect sex ratio and so on. Um, and so this is a, a really brief and, and general overview of what that this project is, where it comes from, and what the overarching goals are. Um, so we wanted to just mention for um, uh, for people who are thinking about joining us in this upcoming year, what kind of the um, cost of entry is. So like, what do you need to participate in Turtle Pop in this version of Turtle Pop? Um, you need to have at least one pond, so a rural or urban uh, pond, we'll talk more about that in a moment, um, with a painted turtle population. Um, so we're focusing on painted turtles because uh, history shows that when you're looking at a bunch of sites across a big geographic region, that that is the most common species that we're going to be able to get uh, the most, the best comparisons for um, across all of these sites that will show up at all those sites. Um, so, And it's the species of focus from Turtle Pop 1.0. So it allows us to look at kind of follow up on that. Um, I suppose ideally uh, in your area, you might have a, what you might consider a rural and an herbal, urban pond, that would be great. Um, we uh, we have two in mind that we, we want to study here at UNH, one that we consider to be more rural, one that is essentially like on the outskirts of the largest city, one of the, one of the larger uh, coastal cities here in New Hampshire. Um, what rural and urban mean, uh, like how we define that, uh, is going to be a little bit, um, a little bit like post hoc after this first year or so. Uh, we kind of want to see what that variation is like um, in the sites that we're able to use, and that you know, for the participants that are there. And so, um, right now, we're just asking people to. You might already be uh, working at a site you know, keep that site. That's great. Um, if it, if it falls into more of a rural type area, you know, less, uh, kind of road density, uh, less maybe human population, um, for your area, that is going to be more rural. Um, urban will be higher road density, you know, in the landscape around the ponds is really the quick and dirtiest way to think about rural and urban right now. Um, now, I, Dave said it that one of the big things we're trying to um, to accomplish in this new version, you know, in, in our change of protocol, is to pick up uh, from the advice from the folks from Turtle Pop 1.0, which was that uh, if we can pair those ponds in a uh, in a relatively local area, um, so have a rural and, rural and urban that are in in proximity to one another, closer pro proximity than the first study, that that will allow us to say more about rural versus urban. Because the last in the last iteration of Turtle Pop, um, a lot of the urban sites were um, were all located in one area, kind of like in the, I think it was in Massachusetts, kind of like near Boston area. Um, and then a lot of the rural were in totally different geographic areas. And so obviously there was a lot of complication there about like, what are we actually looking at, at here? Is it really rural versus urban? Or are there all of these other factors that are driving these changes that they're seeing, right? So, um, but what, what, so we wanted to say that because that's one of the questions we get a lot, which is like, what do we mean by rural and urban? We don't fully have that exact definition yet. So, but that that's how we, and we're happy to talk to you if you're like thinking about choosing sites um, about what might be best. Um, one thing we also want to say about rural and urban is that if you don't have both, 
if you're like in our area, we only have what we would consider based on what I just said, urban or rural, that's okay. After the first year or even couple of years, um, we want to assess you know, what, what ponds have we, have we been sampling at, at as a group and then try to actually reach out in a targeted way to people in that area who can then fill in um, those pairings. So it might not be that, you know, we at UNH or like Felina or Beth that, you know, you would have both a rural and urban, but we might be able to find someone else to fill in that pairing um, in the network. So um, so we wanted to say that. Um, we also wanted to mention because we have some people, which is really exciting, who don't always who don't work with turtles and who don't even work with vertebrates, who have reached out to us and asked about permitting. You know, I hear from my friends who study animals that there are these permits you need uh, to you know to work with animals. Uh, I work with plants, um, and so we have provided, um, and we're assuming that people here and, and most people who are getting access to this video um, have probably seen the materials we shared where we shared language for IACUC approval, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee at institutions. Um, so we shared our language to help you prepare your IACUC protocol um, based on what we have at UNH. Uh, we shared language from our application for state collecting permits um, for turtles. Uh, and so hopefully that will be helpful. And then we also wanted to just mention Another thing too, if you haven't already and you're thinking about um, participating this fall to do is to get at permission access to the properties, to the lands um, that you'll be working on. So um, definitely wanna do that in advance. And then <clears throat> lastly is what does it actually like literally cost um, in terms of money uh, to be involved? That's one of the exciting things about um, a change in methods that we're using. So Dave mentioned that we are shifting to a smaller trap size. It's still a funnel or kind of hoop trap, um, which you can see here on the slide, uh, but it's a lot smaller. So we used to use these big, um, almost like three foot in diameter, two to three foot uh, in diameter hoop traps, which are fantastic. Uh, they're also about 110 or more dollars a pop. Um, and they mean that you will probably be getting some big snapping turtles and some other stuff going on. Uh, beavers, you know, things that eat the traps, whatever, all kinds of stuff that comes along, which is fun, um, but it can be really expensive. And so you can only have a certain number of traps at a site. Um, one of the things that uh, Dave Bown and, and folks from Turtle Pop 1.0 told us is uh, it would be great to have more uh, trap nights, you know, to have more, more power. And so one way for us to do that um, is to, increase the number of traps. Um, and so we're using these smaller traps, which are fantastic for painted turtles. Um, they're also great for some of the other smaller turtles, Blanding's turtles and Spotted's. And, um, you know, kind of anecdotally, some of the, the fish and game biologists uh, tell us that they really prefer them for getting some of those smaller turtles um, and that they, they find that they're even better for getting some of those smaller turtles. So they're also really cheap. Um, it's like two for $25. Uh, and so you can get 10 of these um, for a really um, reasonable amount of money. Uh, and they're really easy to handle too, like to carry you know, to your sites and all of that. So you need to be able to buy 10 of those small traps. Um, calipers, at least one pair of calipers. We usually have more than that because um, we at UNH tend to do this the trapping with classes. And so just so you have more people, uh, you know, hands on at any given time. Um, thermometers, files for marking, you always need to keep buying fish based cat food uh, so that we can bait the traps. And then there are some other things like, you know, little things like can openers and um, at least one pair of waders, depending on your site. Um, for you to be able to get into the water. So we have a, um, in our protocol, which uh, Dave will talk about in a little bit, the materials that we have um, on in the appendix, and you can see just a little screen capture over here. We have a table of all the stuff you're gonna need, including even the little things like can openers um, and you know some links to suggested um, uh, places to purchase them and the cost that they were last year. Um, so we have a full equipment list uh, for everybody there. Um, at this time, we don't have any uh, funding as a project. This is a question we get in some of the other projects that we do through Erin. We don't have any funding as a project to be um, providing that equipment. So that is kind of a, a cost of entry. Um, Dave, do you want to say anything more about that? Okay, great. So, and then the, the last thing we wanted to mention in terms of uh, 
a, a thing that you need to participate is the time to do the, the two full uh, trapping events. Um, and so a trapping event is a three day, three consecutive days. Um, day one is where you're setting the traps. Uh, days two and three are checking traps. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a moment, but we just wanted to share our calendar for what we're planning to do for the two trapping events um, for Turtle Pop this year at UNH. So um, we have uh, a three-day period here coming up next week uh, where we will set traps uh, on the first day, go back and check traps and add fresh bait on day one. Uh, and then go on day three, check traps again. So that would be trapping day two, but it's day three of the trapping event. Um, go back, check traps and pull the traps at that point. Um, and then we say, uh, wait at least two weeks to do your next trapping event. Um, and we're gonna do almost exactly that and go back two weeks later during the first week of the semester with one of our classes. Um, and have another three day consecutive period. Uh, we say in all of our IACUC materials and in the protocol that uh, you um, should come back no, no, how am I gonna say this? No less than, no no more than 24 hours after setting the trap, right? So if, uh, if you set the trap at, uh, at 10 a.m., uh, plan to come back around the same time the next day to check the traps. Um, we also give um, guidance on how you set the trap in the protocol so you're not it's not fully underwater uh, so if you don't come back at exactly 24 hours you just want the turtles to be able to get access to oxygen you know uh to the air and, and breathe and we've definitely gone back a little bit after 24 hours or a little bit before um but that's kind of the um the approximate um we have a comment in uh in the chat about using um, pool noodles to keep traps afloat um, and zip ties. Uh, not sure if maybe the, what the zip tie part is for, but um, yes, to people- hold, Yeah, to hold the noodle to the trap. Oh, okay. So yeah, so people will use pool noodles if, especially if you're using the large traps, that tends to be more of an issue. Um, we've never ever needed to do that with the small traps. I mean, they're like, what 10 centimeter diameter or something like that. I mean, they're, they're or 10 inch. They're like, they're not that big of a trap. And so they don't go that deep. Like we tend to have them right in that shallow area, kind of resting partially on vegetation. We've never had the need to do that. We use a garden stake to, to anchor it down um, and to kind of make sure that we're okay with where it is. Um, but you absolutely could use, um, depending on your site, you could use pool noodles for sure. I only just bring it up because it was a requirement from New Hampshire Fishing Game in our permit this year in the past couple of years to have some type of flotation advice in case of a rain event or in yeah. case a lot of animals entered to sink it. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if that's because of the traps that you were using. I know you use lots of different trap sizes, Jeremy, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. They, oh, I guess they didn't spe specify. They just kept it broad. So we just did it for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that's that's certain. I've seen that more commonly with those big traps that we sometimes use if we're trying to get more of the community and get snapping the big snapping turtles and stuff. Uh, that's interesting, also because that wasn't a requirement in our New Hampshire collecting permit, uh, which is just kind of funny. Um, but but yeah, so that's a pretty cheap uh, cost to add to your list if if you need to. But um, that's a great uh, great tip. Oh, Lucy. Um, yeah, go ahead. So anything else, Dave, that you want to add to that? No, I just had one more question, if I could jump in. Of course. When you said, so that the trapping events, so it's, you do three, session one, you do three for the rural, and then you go, then you did another three for rural, right? So that's session one is in session two. Those aren't different pond locations. That's the same pond. Oh, no, it's the same pond. Yeah. So I guess I should articulate, like, when we have more than one pond, we have more than 10 traps. So we buy, you know, 20 traps and we have, we go to the same pond, like we'll go to ponds one and two on the same day. So we'll we'll go and set traps at pond one, Got set it. traps at pond two, we'll go back and check all of them on day two, all of them on day three. You wouldn't, I mean, if you wanted to stagger it, which we've done when we're trapping at tons of sites, um, what we've done in that case is, um, and if you're able to have the labor to do this, 
Uh, sometimes it's like, how many days do I have versus how many traps can I afford? Um, but uh, what we do sometimes when we can only afford a certain number of traps is we would set uh, set our traps on, let's say, Monday the 14th um, at pond one, check on day two, check on day three, pull on day three, and then run over to our second site, throw the traps in the water, and have day three be like the first day of the second site, and then use the the last three days of the week to to do that. If we had to move our traps, um, that's what we've done. But uh, be, that's the other, I mean, I know we don't all have access to the money to have 20 of them, um, but that is the beauty of how cheap these traps really are, uh, is that you might actually be able to have 20 traps if you have two sites. So, yeah, but and thanks then... for the clarification uh, for the question, Jeremy. So um, the, the trapping event is for any and all of the sites that you're planning to include in the study. You want to have a three-day period at ponds one and, and two, and then a couple weeks later at both ponds again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Great question. Okay. So I, I thought maybe now might be a good idea for us to just walk through what it might look like actually out in the field on a day that you're checking your traps. So day one of a trapping session or event, you're going to be placing your traps in your pond and putting bait in them. Um, and then on the next day and the day after, you're going to be coming to check those traps. So the very first thing you do is you go up and you lift the trap and you see what's inside. Uh, there's going to be a can of bait. Ultimately, you're going to replace that with a fresh can. Um, but there also hopefully will be some turtles in there and potentially some bycatch. So you might get some sunfish or eels or who the heck knows what else in there. Um, any fish, uh, when you first pull up the trap, I would say release them as quickly as you can, get them back in the water and note down on your data sheet uh, what you got there. And that's mainly because a number of these permitting agencies, the state of New Hampshire, for example, request a report of any bycatch uh, at the end of the year uh, when they're looking at annual um, uh, reports of the projects going on in the state. And in so, fact, just to, sorry, Dave, but to jump in, you'll see on our suggested language for IACUC, and I believe possibly also for, for like our fishing game, um, that we anticipate what bycatch we might find in the traps. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is that the trap in this picture is one of the old traps or one of the large traps. Um, so the ones that we're going to be using are like much, much smaller than that. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that we're going to be using you know, one person could easily, well, not easily, but one person can carry all 10 at once, you know, and they're two arms out in the field. Uh, and if you've worked with the larger traps uh, in the past uh, or on another project, you know, they can be a little bit unwieldy and uh, it can take some time to get them set up there, uh, out there in the field. These ones just spring right open and, and are a lot easier to work with. Um, so you'll check your traps. Uh, any turtles that you have, of course, we're going to be processing them, taking a number of morphological measurements, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, and also marking them before releasing them. Um, and uh, those, uh, oftentimes what we do is we just keep them in the trap until we process that individual turtle. Uh, but you could also, if you wanted, move all the turtles from one trap into uh canvas bag or, or a bucket or something like that if you uh, wanted or needed to. Um, at a number of different locations on any uh, day that you're checking traps, we're going to ask that you take both water and air temperature. And so we recommend that you take water temperature at trap one, and then maybe somewhere in trap five-ish area, and then again at the end, um, and same with air. Uh, if you forget, obviously it's not a huge deal, uh, but uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, is easy to forget when you have all that excitement of, oh my gosh, we've got so many turtles, it's awesome, or look at, check out these cool eels we have. Um, it's easy to forget the temperature uh, measurements, but uh, we just want to highlight that here. Try to Try to get a couple of those measurements when you're out there on any given day checking traps. I see there's a, a note in the chat. 
So Jeremy is asking if we're including any hand trapping when going um, to... Yeah, like opportunistic, if you were walking trap to trap and you see a turtle swimming not in a trap, are you including those or no? This is only what's in the traps. We have not been uh, attempting to do any hand trapping when we're out there. Um, okay. So we have a good sense of exactly what the trapping effort is for every site. Um, okay. Yeah, so... But, you know, if you're doing that at your sites, you can always do it, process that turtle and have it on the side and, you know, just put, you know, put a little asterisk next to it and say it was hand caught. And uh, we can always make a decision after the fact, too. Um, so after you're, you check your traps, uh, of course, and, and rebate them, uh, Ideally, you'll have some turtles to what we say process, which is just taking uh, a number of morphological measurements um, and sexing them. Um, and some of those uh, measurements or, or uh, parts of the body are shown up here. You're going to be measuring carapace length and width, plastron length and width. And we're going to have uh, in the protocol some, some more detailed uh, diagrams for you to see exactly what part of the carapace and plastron you should be measuring from, uh, because I know we've received a couple questions about that specifically with uh, plastron width. And so we'll have some diagrams for that exactly uh, where on the bridge we'd like you to, to measure to. Uh, we'll also be measuring uh, two other um, traits that tend to differ between the sexes. Uh, the first that you can see up in the upper right corner here is the pre-cloacal length. And here you'll be measuring uh, s slightly um, pulling on the, the tail or straightening the tail, elongating it. You'll measure from the edge of the plastron to the cloaca, and that will be the pre-cloacal length. And that oftentimes can be used to determine sex really quickly out in the field. A male's cloaca will be located uh, much past or, or at least somewhat past the edge of the carapace and the female's cloaca uh, typically won't make it past um, the, the carapace. So we'll be measuring that actual uh, length there with calipers, but you can also pretty uh, quickly visually determine whether you have a male or female. Uh, we also are in the process of going through some of our data sets to get some ranges for you and pre uh, cloacal length for males and females, at least in our area. So you can get a sense of what some of those values might actually look like. And then over on the right, you can see uh, we're also measuring the third uh, right foreclaw length. And those again tend to be longer in males than females and can be used to sex our individuals. Uh, Jeremy, I see uh, you've got a... Sorry, if I'm annoying, let me know. No, 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 no. no. This is... Uh, I'm really grateful that <laughs> you're in here and, and asking questions. So fire away. Um, it, so two question so um for these two measurements uh pre cloaco and four claw if we can visually identify that it's male or female just like if you get a big one do you still want us to do these or are we doing these measurements no matter what yeah i would say do the measurements no matter what um okay. that's because uh at, at least in my mind it it may be that we need to come up with some sort of actual uh value as a cutoff if we end up or when we end up publishing these data, um, just okay. so instead of just saying, you know, we're identifying it as a male, we can say, look, it's pre cloacal length was this and it's four claws for that. We're pretty darn confident it was a male. So I'll okay. say, and, uh, get those measurements okay. for each individual. And for missing limbs, do we just make an, a note of it saying measurement length four claw can't be measured due to missing limb? That's a really good question. We um, just measure it on the other. Uh, limb. And if both front ones, I'd be surprised. I mean, if both are gone, you just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah Usually true. we haven't come across too many that are missing both of their front feet. Um, I mean, I know it does happen. Uh, so yeah, uh, we would just note that. Um, and hopefully you'd get like a really good sense from the pre length right. of who that is. But, um, but yeah, okay. but, but well, it's a great you. question. And we have had 
toes missing or a hand missing. And so we, because I think we always do the front right, you know, it's just to be consistent. But if that foot or toe is missing, we just go to the other side um, okay. and note that. Okay. Are there any other questions right now? I assume people would just speak up or put stuff in the chat, but just a reminder to please ask if you have any questions. Um, and we have a lot more than we're saying uh, during this call in the protocol itself. And we're planning to add even more to it and add some videos and things like that. So hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions uh, that way as well. So- um, Felina uh, has- Oh, sorry. Right now. Yeah, Felina, what do, what do you got? Um, yeah, a quick question regarding uh, trap losses. You are going to capture a, a snapping turtle, right? You know, that's a good chance they will rip apart your thing and, you know, move away. Uh, if we were to decide later on to do, uh, you know, occupancy modeling or mixed uh, in mixture modeling, we probably wanted to, to note that kind of uh, incident because it's not an actual zero. It's rather a false negative. So, like, does the protocol elaborate on what to do when the trap yeah. is obviously damaged? Right. So, um... The good news is, and Felina, I don't know if you've been using these traps yet, these small ones, but yeah, uh, we've had a lot less of that with the small traps um, than we did with the larger traps because the snapping turtles that we get are tiny um, and they tend to do a lot less damage and we don't really tend to get beavers, like you can get muskrats sometimes, but some of the things that tend to mess up your traps a lot uh, are less common. Uh, and yeah. but that said, we've definitely had it. Uh, we've definitely had uh, holes. And so, yes, if there, um, if you have a trap that is ripped open, um, we, I don't know, honestly, Dave, we should make a note. Um, I don't know how much we articulate that in the protocol, but we should. Um, because I'm hearing in my head, I'm like, oh yeah, obviously you write that down, but no, it's not obvious. Um, so yeah, so yeah. we should definitely articulate that, that if there's any kind of damage like that, um, that, yeah, we're aware that something happened. And if there are no turtles in that trap, uh, we kind of have a sense about maybe why. Um, that, yeah, right. and then there was something else. One of the reasons we also, uh, you know, note bycatch too, it's helpful. Um, because if, I don't know what the experience is of everyone on the call or everyone listening to this later, um, but turtles can get out of these traps. Like it happens, right? And so if you uh, if you had a reason, if you were a turtle in this trap and there was something in it that we found there when we got to a trap and it's like, there could be a reason why a turtle would want to get out of one of these traps sometimes, right? So yeah, we want to note bycatch. We want to note any kind of damage for all of those reasons as well. So yeah, so we will make sure we articulate that. And there was something else that when you brought that question up, I was like, oh, we should make sure to articulate that. Oh, the other thing is, you can pretty easily, and I don't think we wrote this anywhere, but you can pretty easily um, mend these traps if they do, like we, when we collect them, um, we try to do a once over whenever we pull them um, from a site to just make sure that, you know, some of those massive insects uh, and, you know, invertebrates and turtles and whatever aren't making holes that are so big that we're losing some of our animals. Um, and you can use waxed uh, thread, waxed, um, yeah, yarn um, to just basically sew up, like even just with your hands, um, mend these traps very easily. And that's what we do. So we should add that to the protocol as well. Because you don't have to just, you're not like, oh, my trap is destroyed. Um, you can really, really easily mend them. So yeah. Does that answer your question, Thalina? Okay, good question. Thank you for that. Um, I think, Dave, you mentioned mostly some of the those um, measurements we are taking in order to uh, to get the measurement, but also to um, determine sex. Uh, but then we also, and you said this, but are doing carapace length, carapace width, plaster on length, plaster on width, and using um, especially carapace uh, length, and, and some folks also use plaster on length um, to determine the life stage. Um, so aging turtles is not really that straightforward. Um, some people talk about using, you know, the annual rings to age turtles, but if you've ever seen a turtle that's 
scraped its belly along the ground for more than five minutes, uh, it's pretty hard to do that. And so uh, really what we can do though is put them into these classes of sub-adult and adult. Um, and that's probably the most reliable thing when we have this network of people with varying experience and lots of people taking the data that we're gonna do. So um, so we'll, we're will we going to try to provide, well, we will provide um, some kind of approximate thresholds of, you know, if the carapace length is 90 millimeters and above, you know, you can consider that an adult. Um, this varies and we'll, we're, this is one of the areas of the protocol that we're planning to um, enhance a little bit before this fall. Um, this varies latitudinally, it varies geographically. So um, in New Hampshire, where we are, uh, in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Ohio, you know, some of these places, like, it is around the 90 millimeter carapace length that you're like, we start to look at that as an adult. Um, and I think we were reading also the other day that males with four claws of 10 millimeters and greater are considered sexually mature. So that would also be an adult, but you don't have that mark for females. So it's really only for males. Um, we were also reading that in Virginia um, and places that are warmer in warmer latitudes, uh, the carapace, um, threshold is larger, you know, so it might be more like a hundred millimeters as an adult, right? Um, because they're growing at different rates in different climates. So, uh, so we're going to try to provide a little bit of that guidance, but to some extent you might need to just search a little bit for where you're at and see if you can find, uh, that information to really call it adult or sub-adult. Dave, do you want to say anything? Is that, yeah. No, that was wonderful. Um, okay, and then the other thing is we're we're of course doing capture mark recapture. So um, we're going to be marking turtles, and we're marking them using a pretty non-invasive just filing method on the marginal scutes along the edge of the the carapace. Um, and that's what this picture is uh, on the left uh, part of the side. I'm using my my uh, cursor. I realized to point to things, and you can't see it. So Dave can do all that magic, but. Um, so yeah, what we're looking at here is uh, most painted turtles have 12 marginal scutes on each side, like on the right half and the left half, not including this like nuchal scute in the center, the very top. Um, so we don't count that little one at the top in the center. And then we start counting uh, from there to go down to the bottom. Some painted turtles um, will have 13. It's not that common but it happens. And so we always have anyone, we always check and we always have our field folks check um, and just do a quick count and make sure um, that you have 12. One reason for that is, um, well, it's also, it's nice to document any variation like that. Like, are we seeing more with 13 or just asymmetrical or something? Um, but also if you're reading your, your mark, your notches, you wanna make sure if you're reading from the bottom up that you're not counting, like starting to count at 12, but they actually have 13. So um, so you wanna do a quick check, make sure that you have 12 and 12. And then we always avoid um, marking on the bridge. The bridge is that area where the carapace and the plaster on the upper and lower shells are fused and um, connected. And you'll see why when you're, if you haven't held a turtle yet, when you're holding a turtle in your hand and you look at that bridge area, there's no way to really um, notch that in any meaningful way. It just wouldn't work. So we always skip four, five, six, and seven. Um, and just do one, two, and three, and then eight through 12 or eight through 13 as our marks. And it's my opinion, this varies, but we've decided for our project um, to do at least two notches. So no turtle will only receive one notch. Um, so you won't just go out and have it be L, L1, left one. Um, because if something, if there's any kind of damage um, or if over time the notch is kind of hard to read, uh, you want to be able to, you know, see that you want to have more information like, oh, no, this turtle was definitely marked before because I can see the other notch really well. And then it makes you look a little bit closer for for a second notch. Um, and so we tend to start with each turtle getting two notches. And the one that we're looking at right here has a notch in L2. Oh, I'm doing it again in L2 and in, in uh, R2. Um, and we literally use this small metal file from the hardware store, uh, which is on our equipment list. Very cheap. Um, and you just file, like filing a fingernail, uh, a little triangular, we use a triangular file, little triangular notch um, in that skew. Um, we wanted to mention, and we have this in our protocol too, that uh, we are using this 
L1 through 12, R1 through 12 notching scheme. There are others that people use. Um, and if you're already using one in your area, of course, use that. It's really most important that we're uniquely marking individuals and we know who it is the next time you find it. Um, it's also really important to reach out to your uh, fishing game for us, Department um, of uh, Environmental Conservation or whatever it is in your area. I know it's DEC in New York. Um, and ask them if anyone else is doing a turtle study in that area or has, because you want to make sure that you're using the same uh, notching scheme and also that you have a list you kind of coordinate with those people so that you're not double marking you know not using the same mark for two different individuals in the same population um we will we provide uh, if you're starting new and no one has done those studies in your area or that you know of we provide a, a notching scheme that you can print out and use at your site um and you want to have that notching sheet uh, that you cross off whenever you use one uh, for, for an individual, you want to have uh, a one of those sheets for every species. So yes, we're focusing on painteds, but we also will notch and measure and process in this way any other species that we happen to find at our sites. Just for kind of local reasons, we don't need it um, for, for this study necessarily, although we'd love to have it. Um, you know, who knows what we'll be able to do with those data. So um, any questions or Dave, additional comments about Orthelina? I know you were nodding and having thoughts about notching. So any other thoughts about marking um, or questions about marking? Um, I just wanted to, like, I mean, I, I don't know whether certain states have regulations against notching mm. um, because I know it's not invasive, right? It's a very standard technique yeah. because with the pit, Things like pit tag are more invasive than notching. I, I was wondering whether, you know, um, are there any, you know, legislate states that actually does not let you notch? Uh, what alternatives uh, for marking you can think of? I have not heard of that. And the only alternative that is less invasive is writing on its plastron with a Sharpie, which lasts like a week. Yeah. You know, um, so I'm not sure. I've never uh, come across that. Um, I know that in our area, and this is something to ask, this is kind of going the opposite direction of your question, but in our area, if we capture um, state endangered species of concern, our fish and game has asked us to not only notch them, but to also pit tag them um, yeah. because of concerns about poaching and stuff like that. And they just right. want to be able to follow them. So that's a question to ask. But I, Dave, have you, I mean, Felina, have you heard um, of folks not allowing notching i've never heard of it no i did not i'm thinking our state being one of the most you know like stupid actually the word, <laughs> right word to use is actually you know come up with conservative really weird reason like you know yeah you can pit tag but don't notch it's harmful which is actually the other way around right yeah pit tagging actually creates an opening which can even right. get infected if you don't properly you know treat it right um no the, i was thinking you know ahead you know given like you know the how our state particularly new hampshire might not have this problem our state is really oh, weird you know and not i mean i know in massachusetts so. and you know this too in massachusetts they allow it so the fact that they're a yeah. little bit more conservative or protective uh, maybe gives me hope that no, in most places you're going to be able to notch. Um, cause I know Massachusetts yeah. allows it. Absolutely. And yeah. So do you. Uh, another, right. Another question is, you know, like Dave earlier mentioned, uh, or oh, you mentioned that, uh, measuring water and air temperatures. So that's a one-time measurement you take every time you, uh, collect and deploy the trap. Correct. Sorry, which one, um, Selena, which one is the one time? I'm sorry. I Air see. temperature and water oh. temperature measurements. That was, you know, like you mentioned multiple locations, but mm. like, you know, but it's the one time measurement when you deploy slash collect. We usually, you know what? It's funny. We usually don't do it when we deploy. We usually do air and water temperature on the first and second days of checking the traps. Okay. Yeah. Right. And we do it both days just to be like, you know, is there anything about, I mean, ideally, someone asked us recently, um, and it was more because their students kept forgetting to take temperature measurements, but someone asked oh. us recently, like, well, should we be putting, uh, you know, hobos or, you know, some right. kind of exactly. or something? I mean, more power to you. Like, if you have that, if you have that money, we're trying to limit the cost, right? We're trying to, like, right. reduce the cost. Um if you're able to attach a hobo or an eye button to a couple of the traps and leave them out there, 
and get the information that way, that's fine too. Um, maybe in a perfect world, we'd have that because then we would know we might have some idea of how low did the temperature get or high did the temperature get throughout that whole trapping event. And that might tell us why we had low or high numbers, you know, um, that would be ideal. It's, you know, it's that, as you know, Thalina, it's that trade-off with Aaron projects, especially where mm. we're trying to like not keep the cost down. Um, yeah. The question I asked that is I, 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 the, the you know, like in terms of as an environmental covariate that, that one time measurement, may not go that far. Like I, I agree with your conceptually, you know, like getting that lowest temperature is ideally fantastic. But our like, you know, those those one-time measurements might not help collect a good environmental covariate for occupancy modeling. So that's why. I honestly don't even remember if they did temp during the first one, <laughs> during the first round of Turtle Pop. Um, we just thought, it's just one of those things that allows you to maybe have insight if you have sites all over the place, people who aren't as familiar with maybe the system or the system in their area. Um, if they're never getting turtles and they're always doing their trapping events kind of later in the season or earlier in the season or during like a really hot spell or, you know, it might at least give us a sense for those people or those sites. So yeah, it may not be a great covariate in some of the analyses, but it may help us help people choose good times to trap. I don't, that's one of the ways I think of it. Um, any more thoughts on, and yeah. And by the way, um, we were kind of calling this like year one of like the active project, right? Like not a pilot year, but in all honesty, if we discovered something around temperature that was really important to add the following year, um, we wouldn't be opposed to that. So if people are out there and thinking about that and, and we find like a relatively cheap option for, monitoring temperature over time uh, that's something we could consider moving forward you know since we're like a few weeks out from some people implementing this for the first time ever we don't want to throw that on um for this year but yeah dave do you have any thoughts on that no i agree uh with Thelina's point and also uh your response to that yeah in an ideal world it'd be great if we could be measuring year round in an area or like the full season um Looks like Joe has a, a comment in the chat as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so absolutely, if you, admittedly, some of our directions, and we're trying to be um, good about this, but are going to be very like New Hampshire biased, like in terms of, you know, we are more like, if we, if we wait too long, forget it. Like we're not getting turtles, but in your area, absolutely. It could be a little bit later for sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll have to look back uh, at the protocol and what we say about that. Um, I think we're, we're just trying to really caution people who've never done it before, who are in our latitude, uh, not to wait until, you know, a month and a half into their semester because, they might not be getting anything, but that's a great point. Yep. Um, all right, photos. Um, so we ask, and we we do this for all of ours, that folks take um, fo a, a plastron and a carapace photo of each individual. And we do this each time. Um, we do this for several reasons. Um, one is to uh, see injuries over time. Like if an animal has an injury, you kind of get a sense of when it had that, you know, when that injury occurred. Um, so, you know, we've been kind of long-term trapping in our area for a little while. And so this is just part of what we do um, to kind of keep track of the population. We also had kind of some side project ideas about plastron markings and shell morphology and stuff like that, that we thought could be kind of cool if we're gathering these images from a network um, of sites. Uh, we've been talking about this a little bit recently for in terms of collecting those, those data and organizing them and then sharing them with the project. 
um, when you have a lot of sites, it can get a little bit unwieldy, right? So especially if you have a ton of people out in the field with you and they're all using different phones to collect these photos. And I tend to just have my phone be the one that's being passed around. And I'm like, let's do all the photos on this one device. Um, but, and I tend to be there when the students are doing it, right? Or, or I deputize somebody like as being the person who's in charge uh, of the photos for that day. But that's not always possible. We're aware of that. And so this is something that if you couldn't do that, like if for some reason that's not happening, um, and please jump in, Dave, if I'm misspeaking, but we were talking about this yesterday and just saying this is suggested, hopeful, recommended, but if that's a barrier to your experience, that is fine. Like we don't need it. You know, we can still get a lot from your site if you're giving us the morphological measurements and all of the other stuff we've talked about, but you don't have images. That's okay. Um, we've had some su suggestions about, you know, using various apps to collect those data. Um, th there are also kind of issues with some of that, but we're exploring that and thinking about that for moving forward. But for this year, if collecting those images is a barrier, is just like a step too far, and it's going to mean that you're not going to participate, that's fine. Like, don't let that be your thing. Um, we, we don't need it. Um, did, did I say that? Uh, in a way that you're comfortable with, Dave? Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Um, and yeah, the way we tend to do it, if you are taking images, as, as you can see right there, is we have our clipboard, we have our data sheet, which is literally fold the data sheet over so that you can see the top of the data sheet. You can see like the site, the date, all of that stuff right there. And we just write in Sharpie or pen or something what the code is um, and what the pond is if it's not right at the top of the data sheet, which it probably is, um, so that you have all that information there. You have the code right there. We just use the same thing, cross it out when we're done, put the next turtle on, write that turtle's code. I mean, it's really low tech. That's the way we do our images. And yeah, one shot of the top, one shot of the bottom. All right. All right. Uh... So uh, we, we thought we would uh, just remind folks of some of the materials that we've already made available to you all. Um, but we also want to uh, point out some other resources that are going to be coming soon that may be useful for folks. So there is a, a large protocol document uh, that everyone should have access to that uh, includes all of the methodology, uh, also has a number of appendices that have um, data sheets and um, uh, equipment lists and notch code lists and, and so on. So you can find everything actually uh, within that one document. Uh, but a few of the things are maybe important for us to note, and those are two of the documents that I just mentioned that are included as appendices in the protocol. And uh, the first is a data sheet, and you can see an example of what that looks like right here. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. You know, you've got your date and your start time, end time, uh, a little bit about uh, who's out there collecting data, field personnel, um, uh, weather conditions, and so on. Uh, and then uh, you would just fill in your trap number, and then all of the information that you gather for each individual turtle from any given trap. Uh, the one thing I'd like to say here is just if you do pull a trap, let's say trap one, um, and there's nothing in it, write, write that down, write trap one and maybe draw a line through there. And in the comments, write nothing, uh, nothing collected. Uh, that way uh, you just know that it's not that you forgot to check. This sort of harkens back to what uh, Felina was saying about uh, traps being damaged. It's not that uh, you, you just missed one that day. It's you pulled it and checked and there was actually truly nothing in that trap. Uh, so I just want to point that out. And also, uh, this is where you can uh, note whether you have bycatch in a given trap uh, just in the comments column over on the right side of the data sheet. Uh, we also have, uh, as Jen mentioned earlier, a list of all of the potential uh, notch codes. So for any given species at any given site, you'll want to have that uh, code sheet with you at all times so you can cross off codes when you give them to new animals. 
uh, we're going to be next week actually um, recording a number of training videos with uh, with students here in New Hampshire, and we'll get those up on uh, the website uh, ASAP. There are currently a number of training videos that were produced as part of the original Turtle Pop. Uh, some of those uh, screenshots are, are shown here. Uh, so if you need a, a quick uh, introduction on how to measure the, the carapace um, or or what uh, some abnormalities might look like, uh, you can check those out now, but we're also gonna be adding new ones um, as well that might be uh, using the exact equipment that we're gonna be using in Turtle Pop 2.0. And then finally, uh, we so far have a few teaching materials that are available. For example, this link right here will take you to one of Jen's assignments um, that she's used in one of her courses. Uh, and we'll be adding more to this um, th sort of throughout the, the next uh, semester, two semesters. Um, right now, there are plenty of components of the protocol that you can actually just pull directly out of it and put into a lab handout, for example. Um, and so feel free to copy paste to do whatever tweak, uh, whatever you need for that. Uh, but we'll have some more ready made stuff as we go along as well, at least for some of the courses that we teach, like uh, inventory and monitoring, conservation biology, general ecology, herpetology, uh, those sorts of courses uh, will have some more materials that uh, as soon as we have them, they will be up on the, the website for anybody to make use of. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say that uh, that link to the field notes one, um, we added that to the Turtle Pop 2.0 page. So at the bottom, there's a curriculum area and, but it's it's right over on the Aaron Steam page on the Aaron website. Um, so you can link right to that. That's also where the training videos are, is right on the, the Aaron Turtle Pop 2.0 uh, page on the Aaron website. Um, also our screen capture here of the fall 2023 protocol, we haven't shared that with everyone yet. We're currently um, tweaking it a little bit. The one that you have access to is the fall 2022 version. Um, and so we are, we're kind of, we're just trying to add some of those things and we'll add some some additional uh, comments based on what you asked and mentioned today um, to improve the protocol so that it's ready for fall 2023. So we'll be sharing that uh, via email and maybe via the website. Um, but currently I think the website says email us if you want the protocol, um, but we'll be sharing that via email really soon, the 2023 uh, version of the protocol. Um, and the data sheet might be like slightly, uh, improved from the one right here. This is from last year. So, yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's really it. I, we wanted to save some time, um, for you to ask any remaining questions, um, our email, which most of you, all of you have, cause we probably emailed you to give you this, uh, the link for today. Um, is right here, aaron.turtles at uh, gmail.com. Um, please reach out to us. Uh, Dave, Ali, and I all check that. Um, and so we'll get back to you. Um, we're happy to answer questions, you know, throughout the season when you're working with students. If you have issues come up, take pictures, you know, take notes, let us know what's going on. If you need help with anything, we're more than happy to uh, help with that. And also to help with if you don't have your your permit, your IACUC protocol, all of that stuff, you know, the permissions, um, we've had to go through those hoops a bunch. And so we've, we've shared those lang that language, but we're also happy to advise on that um, however we're able. So yeah, are there any, I any have, more questions? I have yeah. more questions, cool. sorry. For it, um, so I know you addressed it in the beginning, like the selecting the pawns, it's right now in this phase, it's a little, you know, um, to learn as we go. Yeah. We definitely have our urban, which we've already done, but I we have two that we want to do um, rural. Can I share a screen and just see what you think? I, it's just we just don't want to. We want to be the you know the, do, be the best we can. Yeah. Um, sure. or, or or just send you the links of which which ones we're thinking of. What do you, I, what's ever best for this group? What are you thinking? Um, 
thoughts from like Dave? Do you have any? Yeah, I'd say the easiest just with it's been a couple months since I've used Zoom because of summer uh, with sharing a screen. If you send links to us, we can take a look and and get back to you uh, asap with okay. those. Take a look with with comments there. Okay. I probably yeah. have kind of similar like site specific questions for for us because we we have our um, our urban pond. It turns out that our the pond right next to our student union is full of painted turtles, as I suspected. So good. Right. Um, but the one I was going to use is the rural pond. It's like on a little nature reserve. I thought it would have turtles. It does not appear to based on our our pilot sampling, or at least not very many. So is there like a it that previous pond? It was so perfect because it was like the same size and only three miles away. I thought it was going to be great, but um. Is there like a cutoff for like how different your rural and urban ponds can be in size or how far apart they can be? Yeah, I'm trying to remember if we've articulated the size, um, the question you're asking, like the size of the pond. I don't think we had. And I'd had like recommendations for how to how to set the traps for ponds of different sure. size. Yeah. Um, and I think like just based on a very quick like Google Earth um, area measurement, our yeah. urban pond, which I think we will use because it's like right on campus. So it's perfect. It's about 0.5 hectares. Um, the other one that was that we I hoped we could use was about 0.3. And then up at our field station, there's like one that's 2.5 hectares, but I didn't know if that was too different in size to be a good comparison or if I should keep looking. And it's also about like a 45 minute drive away. I'm not sure oh. exactly how, how far, but like it is, it's the university's property, so it'd be easy to get permission there, which would be nice. Yeah, but it's but also it makes it far hard enough to go three be... days in a row, twice, two events, 45 yeah. minutes can be rough. Yeah. Dave, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say for the size, I wouldn't worry about it, uh, especially yeah. because we're, you know, we're looking ex at sex ratio and, and things like that. Um, and we can always correct for... Yep you know, population size uh, yeah. for the size of the pond. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, as Jen said, in terms of logistics for you, uh, it, if you think that that's reasonable for you, then I think that that would work uh, in terms of the the prox geographic proximity. You know, uh, I think that's probably on the outer edge of how far apart we would want uh, a rural and urban pair to be about 45 minute drive or something like that. But mm -hmm. uh, if that's the only place you can get to and it's something that you want to do, then great. But if- I mean, there are other ponds, but they're like all on private property and it would be harder to get permission. Whereas like, you know, like I know that if it's on the university's property, that will be easy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. We do the same thing. <laughs> we use the university property for one of our sites for just that reason. So do you, have you tried Beth? You're in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have you- tried to get uh, landowner permission? Like, is it tricky in your area to get landowner permission to do these things? I mean, I guess, mo honestly, most of the places I've sampled have either been on university property or like in a state forest. And that that's also a little bit complicated because there's a permit you have to file like in February of the year you're going to sample. And sometimes mm -hmm. you don't know in February of the year yeah. you're going to sample. Because um, we've but, had like, yeah. I, I mean, there are some people who are just like, no, I don't want you on my property ever. Um, New Hampshire is an interesting state, uh, but we have a ton of landowners who are so excited uh, if you're going to be trapping turtles on their property. Yeah, um, I guess if size doesn't matter, there is um, there is a reservoir um, just up the road that's city property um, that mm -hmm. I know has painted turtles in it, but it's it's like huge. It's like, you know, the reservoir for the city of Oneonta. Um, But yeah, I guess if the if it's OK to do like a tiny little pond on campus and compare it to like a huge reservoir. We could do that, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I might send you an email with yeah. a menu of lakes from which we can choose. Um, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, we can narrow it down. Okay, thank you. One of our sites is maybe not as big, but is like a reservoir. Like one of our sites is pretty big and extensive network. So um, yeah, we like Dave was saying, like we can correct for like density you know and like where you're trapping in a site and all of that we can try to so yeah yeah and just for I'm forgetting that we're also sharing this as a recording so um for anyone who's seeing this later um if you have if you folks know people who want to be part of the project like uh 
send us if you're trying to pick sites and you want help, you know, on that, or you want to make sure that one is going to be okay, like just send us that information. Um, and we're happy to like consult on that. And it will probably help us too to give people more guidance uh, in the future on picking their sites. So we're really happy to do that. Uh, bait, can we, I know you said the fish, uh, the, the cat food, um, if we've been doing sardines and olive oil at previous, would you prefer that we stick to the same bait for this project? I mean, we've talked a lot about bait because, so I, when I first started trapping turtles many, many years ago, we always use sardines. Um, cat food's cheaper. <laughs> um, and, uh, we, yeah, we, we've started using cat food here in our area because that's what the folks who've been trapping here forever have been using. We've just been trying to be consistent. We've been thinking about doing a side uh, study at some point on bait type and trap size to try to see how much these things matter. Um, so if people are using slightly larger hoop traps, if they're using, I think we talked about this with you actually, Jeremy, at one point, but yeah. Um, we using did, yeah. different types of bait, using uh, using bait in different ways. So some people put like little holes in the can and some people like open it up and put it in a bag and, you know, um, and how much those things matter. Um, anecdotally, uh, Allie, one of our, our co-leads, um, they were finding that when the students, some of the students were putting like holes in the can and some of them were like opening it up and it was, you know, in the water more, that they were again, anecdotally, that they were having different experiences with how many turtles they were getting um, based on how they were setting the bait. So I tend to be a little conservative about this. I'm interested to hear what Dave says, but I tend to be like, be good if we could stay with one kind of bait right now. Uh, that's where I, that's how I tend to fall on it. Um, but I honestly don't know how much it matters. Like we don't, I don't think we know yet. Yeah. So I, I'm with Jen in an ideal world. I would say, yeah, if you could use some fish-based cat food, wonderful. But the truth is that different cat foods may have different makeups. Like I, I don't I typically look to see what's in, you know, Friskies versus uh, Iams versus Purina uh, or whatever it might be. And so again, like going back to the, you know, photographs is, are, taking photographs is going to keep you from doing it. Like if you've got sites that you're working at and you really feel strongly that you want to keep using sardines, I say use them and just make notes. you're using sardines. Let us know. And yeah. we can throw it into, I'll, you know, dump it on Allie's plate and say, throw this into <laughs> your model somehow and, uh, and make sense of it. Uh, so yeah, like in an ideal world, fish-based cat food, if you feel really strongly about your sardines at your sites, keep them there, but just let us know. And not okay. to go too far down the cat food rabbit hole, but um, we tend to choose cat food or fish, like Dave was saying, fish-based cat food, like tuna, whatever, or salmon, that is like the fillets, not that like pate. densely packed pat pate stuff, um, just because it breaks up a little bit more and goes kind of like sardines, uh, Jeremy. It's like a little bit more like that. It's got like the gravy and it like goes out into the water a little bit more. So we tend to use that filet based stuff. And we, what was the brand you just said? Sorry, Chewy? Oh, I think he was just kidding. Like he was just like, oh. friskies, like that's one. Okay. But we use whatever's cheapest. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Joe, I see your, is your hand up from before or is it new? Uh, no, I just put it up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that in my experience, um, if I just poke holes in the can, it, it seems to have a, a longer uh, trapping window. Whereas Ooh. if I open the can, the, the sardines or the cat food can get out of the trap and it just doesn't seem quite as effective to me personally. Totally agree. Yeah, we, um, we I think, are super nerdy in the protocol and we're like, use the can opener to make like six V notches around the can, you know, like we do the same thing. We just make those like triangular notches in the top of the can all around the top of it. Um, but for the most part, you come back and you still have some left in there and it's like kind of coming out over time um, unless you have the disgusting leech experiences uh, that we had this summer, which was really fantastic um because something's you know sometimes you come back and it's completely empty 
you're like, how did that happen? There's nothing in this trap. So uh, yeah, larvae and stuff eating it, but totally agree. Yeah. And I think we have that in the protocol. Yeah, Selena. Yeah, I mean, I think if you have a protocol regarding, you know, like, you know, like putting this many holes in this shape, you know, that's actually ideal. I just wanted to share that I take the tuna out of the can and put them in muslin bags. Mm -hmm. And um, that actually worked a lot better than, you know, hanging up the can, um, you know, partially open like most people do. So, uh, uh, muslin bags are dirt cheap. You know, you buy, I don't know, 500 for like what, five. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, for coming. Um, yeah, I the I mean they're basically like the reusable tea bags, right? Just those big reusable tea bags. Yep, um, cloth tea bags. Yep. Um, yeah, I've never done that. Um, because I don't know, we just are. Uh, I don't know if the right word is lazy about it. We just take the can and like make a bunch of holes in it and throw it in the trap. Like we don't attach it on the inside. So we're just like, it's in the trap. We've never come back and not had one in there. Um, so it's it's pretty um, uh, simple. Yeah. But but yeah, uh, again, that's kind of like, I guess if you're using that method, just letting us know, because that's like a slight variation on how we're doing baiting. Um, but those are some of the things that we thought it might be fun to have some undergrads play around with, like do some experiments, you know, at some point have like a little experimental component where they're some of we know that some of the folks who want to do turtle pop 2.0 have done trapping before and have the larger traps so we were thinking doing different trap sizes doing different baiting styles and baiting types it could be um, especially if we end up having a bunch of people on the project we can end up being able to provide a service for people who are doing turtle trapping by actually giving the answer to this question that we're all just giving anecdotal uh, answers to right now. So that could be fun down the road. Any, I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, Dave, is there anything else that's like jumping out at you that we forgot to say or any other questions? I'm trying to remember some of the questions we got over email. Yeah, I know uh, there were some comments from folks who participated last year in a, in a really small pilot season, um, asking about the number of traps and, and that mm. sort of thing. And uh, this year, we're going to try to stick with 10 of these smaller traps for our sites, but uh, we're open to feedback in the future. So if people are, feel like they're getting hammered with so many turtles, um, we are listening. So please, if you participate, which we hope you do, please share any feedback with us and, and keep us sort of up to date with, with how things are going and how things might be improved um, on your end. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason that we increased from, I can't recall off the top of my head if it was four or five uh, of the large hoop traps in the original Turtle Pop to 10 of the smaller ones, um, was because by doing that, we're able to just increase the trapping effort so dramatically um, without at all, with actually lowering the cost um, of the of the project. And so it just seemed like a really good way because that was one of the um, pieces of advice from the folks who led the first program, the first round was that it'd be nice to have more power, you know, by having more uh, trap nights. Um, and so that's that's one of the reasons also, and this goes to one, something Joe brought up earlier about, you know, time window, the ideal time window for trapping. And we talked about how it varies a lot geographically, um, latitudinally being one of those. In our area, if we're trapping like in September in New Hampshire, um, we're doing 10 traps also because we want to get turtles. <laughs> like we want the sites that have lower population sizes or that are in, you know, just areas that have less turtle activity at that time of year um, to be able to have enough turtles captured to be part of the project, to be, you know, to contribute to the project. And also we have an educational, uh, you know, component and we want the, the students to be able to get turtles. And, you know, sometimes we go out with 10 traps and we only have turtles in several of those. So um, that's just to give a little like behind the scenes on like why we're trying to stick with 10 right now. Um, but like Dave said, we're, we're open to 
maybe dropping it down by a few traps uh, in the future if that becomes a real issue for a lot of people in the project. Other than that, I would just encourage people to to reach out. Uh, let us know if you've you've got any other questions uh, or anything we can help with. Happy to do it. Yeah, and thanks to those of you who are able to come today and give feedback, ask questions in real time. I know it's going to help people who see this later, and it's going to help us while we're doing finishing touches on the protocol for this year. Um, because every time someone asks a question and we're just so used to doing it, it reminds us to be more explicit about that uh, in the protocol. So we really appreciate it. Um, we're going to uh, share this recording um, and uh, and send that around and also ask uh, folks to like let us know if they're thinking about participating this year, just so that we know who's, uh, who's out there doing it um, and that we can maybe send materials if things come up and uh, and be of service to you. So um, expect that soon that we'll be sending out the, the link to the recording. And please, please, please feel free to share that email or any of the stuff we've sent with you to friends, colleagues, people who might want to participate who, you know, don't know about it yet or weren't here today. Um, we, we're not, we're trying to be very inclusive and have anyone who has these painted turtles and the ability to do this be part of the project. So please share, spread the word. <laughs>